So there's a tremendous optimism today about ending AIDS. UN AIDS last week uh, announced their 90-90-90 plan. Um, the US president, where I'm from, has spoken about it, as has our sec former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. Uh, we hear it from the head of the Global Fund, Mark Dybul, who formerly headed PEPFAR. We hear this optim optimism all over the place, and we hear it from Canada. And Julio Montana in Vancouver has been a, a loud proponent of this notion. Um, and I want to just jump back in history. There were a lot of years that were really horrible. And this is a protest at the NIH that I attended in 1990, um, led by ACT UP primarily. Um, there was not a single anti-HIV drug until 1987. The, the epidemic surfaces in 1981. The virus is identified in 83. In 84, you have uh, the definitive proof that it causes AIDS. In 87, the first drug comes on the market, AZT. It doesn't work all that well. Keeps people alive for maybe 18 months um, extra. And the um, AIDS activism movement emerges and grows with frustration. And the frustration um, is t targets things like uh, government and big pharma. And there are very few successes. To Testing is a success. The development of an, of an antibody test for HIV was a remarkable su success. And condoms and counseling and education. Um, I, I obviously can't spell that. So it could, counseling and education. And, and by 93, when there's a conference in Berlin, the International AIDS Conference in Berlin, it's called the Doom and Gloom Conference because there's just so much frustration and, and, and outrage about how slow things are moving and how the only drugs that exist then, AZT, DDI, D4T, don't seem to do anything together that people had hoped they would do. And people are dying, and, um, and, and they're dying young. But then in late 95 comes a protease inhibitor that uh, adds to a cocktail. And by 96, this led, uh, leads to Newsweek uh, putting on its cover the end of AIDS with a question mark, which is a trick that journalists use when they want to be coy. And, say something without saying it. Um, but that's how much optimism there was. Now, at the time, I attacked this cover, as, as well as a cover of the New York Times magazine, in an article I wrote for Slate as um, uh, premature triumphalism. We saw this enormous surge in funding that occurred after the Durban AIDS meeting in 2000. And basically, in Durban, activism became an international affair. And the world was put on notice that, um, as Jeffrey Sachs, the economist, said at that meeting, it would cost a movie ticket and a bog bag of popcorn to get everyone in the world who needs antiretroviral drugs, antiretroviral drugs. This must happen. And there was a, a Supreme Court justice from South Africa, an HIV-infected gay man, who judged the world and stood in front of the audience and said, this is like Nazi Germany. This is like apartheid. This has to end. And lo and behold, to the astonishment, I think, of everyone, it did change the funding stream. So access doesn't equal use. This is today, the CDC put out this information about the United States and our treatment cascade. I imagine most of you have seen this. But basically, what it's showing you is that um, in the United States, 14% um, of the people who have HIV don't even know they have HIV. And, and then of the people who know, only 40% are engaged in care. Only 37% in total receive um, a prescription for an antiretroviral. And the virus is only fully suppressed in 30% of people. If treatment as prevention is going to do anything, people have to be fully suppressed. They have to be taking their medication. If they're not, treatment as prevention isn't going to work. Um, Ontario has one of the best looking treatment cascades I've ever seen. So, um, you know, congratulations to Ontario. Um, you know, but before you dance in the streets, you only have about, you know, 60% of the people who are fully suppressed. That's probably not good enough to do much in terms of ending an epidemic. It will certainly slow transmission. It's a positive thing. But you've got to do better. The systems in much of the world are overloaded. There are patients on the floor here. This is in Shlavisa, in, um, in KwaZulu-Natal, and, and not far from Durban in South Africa. This is last September, a year ago. This is not an ancient photo. 
They're so overwhelmed, they have about 33% prevalence in their pregnant women. Um, yeah, one in three. So, you know, when you get to that level of prevalence, uh, you have an incredible challenge to, to help the infected people and to, and to do prevention. So what can we do better in prevention? One thing is we can target um, micro hyperepidemics, and this works very well theoretically in concentrated epidemics. It would be hard to do this in South Africa, but here in Canada, in the United States, in Mexico, in Europe, in, in, in much of the world outside of Sub Saharan Africa, the virus is in specific populations. So it is in men who have sex with men, it is in people who um, inject drugs and share needles, it's in sex workers. You can concentrate your efforts on those populations. But what San Francisco has done is broken out where the viral load is highest in the city. So this heat map shows you in the darkest blue which neighborhoods have the highest viral load. You can then target those neighborhoods because something's going wrong in those neighborhoods. The key affected populations are marginalized populations. In my blunt language are the hated populations. These are people who by some segments of society are hated. And because of that, they're not given the humane care that they need for their complicated problems. Um, in New York City, they reduced, New York City has more injecting drug users than any place on earth. There are estimated 200,000 in that city. They have reduced the, um, the new infection rate, that shouldn't say prevalence, the, the incidence to below 1%. That's astonishing. That's just astonishing. In many populations that don't do anything for injecting drug use and harm reduction, you'll see the virus introduced and it will go into 50% of the population within six months. That is an astonishing accomplishment of New York City. That's because they very aggressively offer clean needles and syringes and opiate substitutes and counseling and reunite people with their families. It's a whole package. Um, there are creative ways to reduce risks as well. This is a dance instructor in Haiti teaching sex workers how to become dance instructors so that they have an alternative way to make money. There are new diagnostics now that more readily can, uh, can detect acute infection with uh, nucleic acid testing in big machines like the one at the right. Um, this is San Francisco, which recently has introduced it with its most progressive um, Department of Health that I think all of us can learn from. But there are these major structural issues that are underlying HIV transmission and treatment everywhere. Migration and deportation is one of them. Um, prison is another. Prison is an excellent environment to get people on good treatment and care. They are captive. And there's a, a terrific program in Rhode Island um, led by Jody Rich that is a model, I think, for the world of how to get prisoners on treatment and keep them on treatment. They use blister packs for their pills. And so they can take them to their rooms and pop out their pills and keep track of when they need. They teach them how to take care of themselves and in a very good environment. Um, mental health and homelessness are pervasive everywhere when people are having trouble staying on treatment. Um, these were two transgender men getting help from a program in the United States that the federal government supports for housing for HIV-infected people. Um, the man in the yellow shirt had jumped off a bridge and tried to kill himself. Um, and the one on the left had also tried to commit suicide. They both need a lot of help. They need a lot of care to stay on their antiretrovirals. And as the guy on the right said to me, why do I care about taking my antiretroviral drugs? I don't want to be alive. So if that's where you're at, it's going to be hard to get to undetectable. This guy lives in this sewer hole he has for many years. That's his syringe in front of him. When you're living in a sewer hole, it is hard to receive help. These are Christian missionaries who are... Um, helping him, but they're not helping him with his HIV problem, um, <clears throat> which is HIV risk. Cure is possible. Timothy Ray Brown is on the right side, the left side of the image. Timothy um, <clears throat> had leukemia. He's famous for his bone marrow transplants that apparently have led to his cure. And his two, two bone marrow plant transplants were for leukemia. Um, he had an unusual situation where his doctor realized that there were naturally resistant people who had a mutation on their CCR5 receptors, one of two receptors HIV uses, <clears throat> and he found a donor who had those mutations. So he received conditioning for his bone marrow transplant, which means he was, his whole body was irradiated. He was given chemotherapeutic drugs to kill off his own immune system. He then was given a donor's blood who 
had this weird mutation that's in about 1% of Caucasians. He then also had graft-versus-host disease because the donor attacked his body, as often happens with transplants. But graft-versus-host disease, as we know from leukemia, is also graft-versus-leukemia disease, which is good, and it's also probably graft-versus-HIV. So he had all this stuff going on. It's been hard to figure out exactly why Timothy's been cured, but it's a lead. The guy next to him, by the way, is receiving a gene therapy that's trying to do the same thing. That's Matt Sharp, and he's getting his own cells taken out and his own CCR5 receptors crippled <clears throat> by the gene therapy and then put back into him to see if that might lead him to control his virus more effectively. We know the recipe. We know how to end AIDS epidemics. I just put it into recipe form because it's not that big of a deal. We know it. All these things have been proven scientifically to work. <clears throat> and our character is, is our destiny, as the Greeks say. This is a new slide from UN AIDS that shows the two alternate scenarios. In blue, it shows what would happen if we used the tools we had today to try to stop the AIDS epidemic around the world. We could do it. We could bring new transmission rates below one. In, in, in other words, we could bring each infected person down, down so much in risk that they were unlikely to infect another person. But the other trajectory in red is what's going to happen if we just keep doing things at the rate we're doing them right now. I'm afraid we're, we're far more red than blue. Um, and that's my, my bottom line assessment. Aspirations can match reality. The woman in the yellow vest uh, works with the University of California at San Diego as an outreach worker with the um, injecting drug users who live in the canal here. The woman in the yellow vest lived in the canal for eight years. She's HIV infected. She's undetectable and has been for years. She's been off heroin for 14 years. <clears throat> she's doing really, really well. And she's my great sense of what can happen. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone, um, in, including OHTM, for having me and all the people who have voluntarily allowed me to show you their photos. Everybody's given me permission for that. And Malcolm, the photographer I've worked with for many years. <clears throat> and science, which has given me this phenomenal job where I'm able to cover this um, epidemic and, uh, and travel as much as I've been able to. So thank, thank you all very much.